All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Yashua Bengio. Yashua is a professor at Université de Montreal. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Yashua, welcome back to the podcast. My pleasure. Uh, it is great to have you back on the show. You have been spending a lot of time recently thinking about AI safety and catastrophic uh, risk uh, and the, the risks of misuse. Uh, we'll be spending quite a bit of time digging into that topic, but uh, I'd love to have you share a little bit about what you've been working on since the last time we had an opportunity to speak with you, which was, um, that was back in March of 2020. We spent a lot of time talking about the things that you were working on in the context of consciousness and the COVID-19 response. It was quite a while ago. Well, the it's interesting you, you mentioned the COVID because um, it, when COVID hit, um, I, I got really motivated to better understand biology and chemistry mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was thinking, you know, maybe the tools of machine learning that we've been developing in my group could be useful to accelerate the development of uh, new drugs, new vaccines, uh, antivirals, for example. Um, so I, I, I read a lot. I talked to uh, a lot of people. It turned out I had some students with good backgrounds in, in biology and chemistry. And we started at full speed uh, developing uh, new kinds of generative neural nets that can help search in the space of drugs. And uh, that, that program has been very successful. We wrote a lot of papers. Uh, we, you know, uh, we've been collaborating with many companies that uh, in biotech or pharma. And at a scientific level, it's really um, brought me into thinking about, well, how does the scientific uh, process work? You know, where you have data and then you, you form theories and maybe there are several theories that are compatible with the data. And then mm -hmm. you come up with experiments that allow to disentangle between those theories that, that fit the data. Um, and then you carry the experiments. How can machine learning help us all the way through that loop? And eventually, you know, could we even think of having AI systems that behave like scientists that, that explore the world, trying to make sense of it, build a good, uh, Bayesian understanding of how things work. So here, Bayesian means it, you're not just locking into a single explanation for things, a single theory, but try to keep track of all the theories that are compatible with whatever data you're interested in. Yeah. Um, I got also very interested in causality then. And uh, I mean, I had been before, but but uh, the effort um, on causality is related to this because if we, if we build a good causal understanding of how things unfold, then uh, this is going to usually make more robust theories. And, you know. So so that's been uh, a lot of the work in my group um, and developing the underlying uh, machine learning and mathematical uh, ideas. In particular, we developed this method that came out in Europe's 21, um, just motivated exactly by this problem uh, that we call generative flow networks or G-flow nets. And we have now like 15 papers on this. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, it, it, and then this year, of course, things have been uh, really uh, special for a lot of people in AI as we <laughs> realize that, well, where are we now? Where is it going? What can go wrong? Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. As well as uh, what is what's going right. Like the the yeah. interest in. Uh, large language models, generative AI, that's all, um, well, it was greatly accelerated uh, at the beginning of this year, end of last, and it's um, yep. been a, a cause for a lot of conversations, a lot of interesting conversations. I'm curious, you mentioned that a lot of the work around science has led your group to engage in thinking about causal modeling, causal machine learning, What's your take on the state of the art there, state of the uh, of the methods? How uh, how closer are we to where you think we need to be in order to be able to apply causal models effectively for the to the kinds of problems you're looking at? So we now have methods that work really well 
on a small scale. And um, like I was mentioning there, Bayesian meaning that you don't get out just a single causal model, like this variable causes this one and this one causes that one, which we call a causal graph, but actually you can come up with um, a generative model that can sample these causal graphs. In other words, that come up with the, the, the causal theories um, you, you can sample from the Bayesian procedure over theories that are consistent with the data. And, and that, that's great, but it's not going to be sufficient to deal, for example, with uh, one of the objectives we had of a uh, causal model of cells. You've got 20,000 genes, <laughs> you've got the RNA, you've got the proteins, you've got the genes themselves that are being activated or not. And uh, that, that scale, we, we don't know yet how to deal with. Uh, but but so you know, lots of people are like really motivated at this because we could unlock how biology works, and mm -hmm. and thus really help the discovery of new uh, therapies. Mm -hmm. And so, when you you think of scale as a limitation, does that imply that uh, we just lack fundamental algorithms that allow us to take advantage of all of the compute and data that we have nowadays? Um, both. So we we need new algorithms that will allow to take the principles we have discovered in the last few years to uh, much, much uh, more complex uh, domains. Mm -hmm. And we need the compute, which we typically don't have in academia, but that <laughs> others have. And maybe even less of it now that it's all going to training language models. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> even uh, impossible to buy GPUs these days. Forget yeah. about the, the, just the, the costs uh, usually, but now it's uh, there's such a, a gold rush going on in the right. AI world of companies vying for survival at each other's throat, which is one of the things that worries me that we're not going to be sufficiently careful because the commercial survival, uh, you know, interests are so strong. Uh, let's maybe transition into speaking about safety in the context of science and healthcare. Safety has long been a part of that conversation, uh, primarily from the perspective of, you know, these are mission critical life critical applications we can't have a a learn system making the wrong prediction and uh, not having human oversight safety means uh slightly different things in the context of uh llms and agi uh when you talk about safety uh what are you thinking about there uh and let's lay out the landscape yeah let's do that so because there are a lot, and in fact, part of the problem is there are probably a lot of risks we don't even think about right now, and someone will find a way to use those technologies, maybe the ones coming in coming years, in harmful ways that could be catastrophic or maybe minor. It's hard to say. But right now, top of mind to many people worrying about um, short-term safety are is you know disinformation, Mm -hmm. um, the use of AI uh, to influence people's minds. So, you know, AI is already used in advertising and it works, presumably, otherwise it wouldn't put so much money into it. Right. Um, if those AI becomes more powerful and they're used to, you know, in a political way, then, then it gets really scary. Or if you think about, say, uh, Russian trolls, if they have access to ways that can scale up the, the troll army, by AI systems that can dialogue in a way that's convincing. Because a, a key thing to keep in mind here is that we now have systems that can dialogue with us in a convincing way where it's hard to say if you're talking to a human or a machine. And if you're not you know, thinking about it, you might start thinking, oh, you're developing a friendship with this guy on, online. Mm -hmm. And uh, once they're friends with you, they, they, they might try to shift your political opinion. Um, yeah. on something. So that's this information. Uh, of course, uh, not just dialogue. We, we, we've had deep fakes and they're just getting better and better and harder to detect. Right. Uh, we need changes in the underlying technology, like, you know, the way we capture images and sounds to, uh, to protect ourselves. Right. Right now, it, you know, it, we, we, we have methods to, uh, discern whether an image was uh, generated by AI or was genuine, but the battle is going to be, I mean, the war is going to be lost. Um, 
it, it, these systems are getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So, so we need other techniques, um, and I think there are ways to to protect us from this. So that's that's roughly the disinformation category. Um, another one that I'm very worried about, which could come quickly, I don't know, but but maybe maybe one or two years later, is uh, dangerous cyber attacks. So uh, right now uh, we have cyber attacks, but, but they're done by small groups of humans and they're defended by small groups of humans. And, and we kind of, uh, we've developed sort of immune system that minimizes the damage to something tolerable. But what if the programmers doing this uh, are now aided uh, by AI and eventually AI is, is really cooking the, the attack completely. So apparently you can already buy on the dark web LLMs that have been, I don't know, jailbreaked or tuned for uh, uh, fraud and, and cyber attacks and, and disinformation. Mm. So it's, I, I imagine these systems aren't too dangerous yet, but what is it going to be for the next versions of these LLMs? Uh, right. It's hard to say. How much time is it going to be before we have AI systems that are really superior to the best programmers, then like we're, we're in trouble. Um, we don't have the right uh, defenses to protect ourselves. We need to invest in uh, kind of national security protections against the use of AI, the misuse of AI in ways that could be large scale dangerous for society. Mm -hmm. So cyber attacks um, is, is one example. Uh, two others that people have been talking about are um, chemical weapons and biological weapons. Um, mm -hmm. There's been already a paper showing that with current AI systems, so these are not LLMs, um, they've been just trained on chemical databases. You can now generate easily new compounds that are not in the databases of companies, you know, they know you shouldn't sell this, you shouldn't sell this because it's, it's toxic, it's dangerous, but they could be new compounds. And then it's going to be harder for these companies to, uh, to do the right thing. And then um, it's a little bit more down the road, but uh, bioweapons are even more scary than, than chemical weapons because a chemical right. weapon, you know, it, it's going to kill whoever, you know, gets it maybe in the water. So maybe a whole city will, uh, be affected, but but bioweapons they they reproduce themselves, right? So they're they're mm -hmm. like living beings, like viruses. So we create a new pandemic. Well, right. <laughs> imagine how much damage this could do. So right now, the 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 shorter term problem with these is the the LLMs know so much stuff that, that mm -hmm. they can help, uh, say, a terrorist or a bad actor. Uh, who may not have the skills, you know, you need like a PhD in a very specialized area to know how to, what's, what sequence of operation do you need to do to carry in order to uh, build something dangerous, to design a new uh, pathogen or even just an existing one and just know the procedure. Uh, so the LLMs will answer these questions. Not Right now, they're, people are trying to create safety uh uh, guardrails, but but they, they they don't work very well. That that it's fairly easy to bypass them. So yeah, all of these are scary. And then you got the the thing that really keeps me at night is um, it maybe sh longer term. We don't know. Is it going to be five, ten, twenty years when uh, those systems? You know, we reach the AGI like human level uh, competence yeah. in enough areas. It doesn't have to be on everything. Like it's just enough that. They are good enough at, say, influencing us, at making money, um, and maybe you know, designing uh, dangerous weapons, whatever. Um, if if they're good enough in some number of critical areas, um, and they have their own self interests uh, as a goal, self preservation, which can happen for several reasons, um, then it's like we create a new species that that wants to not be turned off um mm -hmm. and 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 that if it's smarter than us we might have trouble uh turning it off it could copy itself for example on on many computers and then it gets really hard uh, i could elaborate on all these things but that's the sort of uh dangerous that uh i and many others are worried about one thing that's interesting about the way you articulated that landscape is that the the first chunk of those risks um, you know, is not AGI, which you can, you know, I think people will differ in, 
you know, whether they think that's, you know, five years, 10, 20 years, or even attainable. Yes. But even if you don't believe in it, in, you know, that we should be investing significant resources in that, uh, there is a, a large segment of the risks that you've articulated that are, you know, less about some ill-intended software system and more about the abuse of uh, software systems by, you know, people in power, people who want power uh, or people who want to exactly. take advantage of them. And um, I think we can all relate to, to that as a risk. I mean, we already have we already have a lot of power concentration in our society, and it's already a big problem. And democracy isn't like as healthy as we would like, right. nor is inclusivity and uh, you know the protection of minorities, or even think not just in one country like the U.S., but uh, developing countries. That, that, that there are lots of problems of power concentration. What right. I'm concerned about here is AI may make things worse. <laughs> in that respect to the point where like at one extreme where we, we we go to the AGI extreme, even if we solve the safety problem, like we can design AI systems that uh, are not going to blow in our face and become runaway. Mm -hmm. Even if we did that, there's still the danger that some, some Putin of the future uh, exploits AI in order to create, you know, to have more power first economic mm -hmm. power, political power, military power, and, and becomes like the dictator of the world. And if it uses, if, if, if that sort of government uses AI to monitor everyone and control everyone, we might be stuck in like dark ages for a thousand years. Uh, it's, right. uh, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but it's, it's the extreme point of power concentration. We can see it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess one question that I have is, you know, why now? for you? Like, why is this issue so top of mind uh, for you now? You've been writing about it quite a bit this past year. Is it, uh, you know, the, an obvious correlation is the, the rise of LLMs. Is it that you see in LLMs uh, much greater risk of abuse than previous versions of, you know, machine learning, deep learning? Uh, and yet you kind of didn't see the same uh, easy access that uh, that you see now? I think there could be problems with current LLMs, but I'm mostly worried about we're now much closer in number of years to a situation where the AI systems have become sufficiently capable in sufficiently critical areas that society becomes at risk at, at a large scale. So it's not just like a few frauds that are going to happen. It's 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 like destabilizing democracy or like bringing our economy down and you know or loss of control and all of these things. So what happened is when uh, Chat GPT came out, I like many other AI scientists, of course, I you know I played with it, mm -hmm. and my immediate uh, attitude was ah, I can find queries uh, for which the system you know produces uh, incorrect answers. Right, we can break uh, it. It confirms what I've been saying for many years that uh, we are still missing the system to reasoning, you know, conscious right. processing abilities that we discussed, um, and and they they are missing. But so first of all, there was a big uh, improvement going from uh, GPT three point five to four on these things, and second, because of the work I've been doing in my group on system to deep learning. How do we make neural nets that can reason? I suspect that it might be just around the corner that we fix this. It's just like maybe a slightly different way of training these systems, if you want. Uh, and maybe not. I can't, you know, I can't say, uh, because what, until we figured it out, you know, we don't, we don't know, but it, it might be very close. It might be 20 years. It might be just next year. Then of course it takes time to be deployed and so on. But the, the point is there is a lot of uncertainty and, and that's very, and it could be short term. And that's very different from the perspective I had before chat GPT, because in, in universities, we, the, the kinds of uh, language models or neural nets we could train that are, that were much smaller than the ones you could, you know, people have been doing in industry. These neural nets are dumb. Um, it's hard to imagine such how such a, a, a stupid system can, can be 
eventually surpassing human abilities. But really, uh, over the course of last winter, I realized, oh, gee, we're much closer to AGI than I anticipated. I thought it'd be decades, and now I don't know. It could be much shorter. And that really triggered my thinking about, well, what could happen? How could that be misused? What happens if we do reach AGI in the next mm -hmm. 10 years? What does it mean for humanity? What could go wrong? Uh, how can we make sure this doesn't happen? I remain um, skeptical about AGI. It feels like... To exist at all, you mean? I don't know if it's quite to exist at all. I think, you know, to exist in an absolute way, uh, meaning, you know, very, very general. And I think what's compelling for me about the way we're talking about safety in this conversation is that it doesn't really presuppose, you know, solving that problem, which to me feels like, you know, you work on a project and you feel like you're 95% done, but that 5% takes another 95% of the, the time. Like, I feel that there's a persistent kind of, it's possible, but there's also a, a moving of the goal line. It always seems, you know, 20 yeah. years away. But 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 I have, I, I changed my view on this. Um, okay, tell me so more. So in, 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 the, in the writings uh, I did uh, last spring, I was talking about, I wrote about like superhuman AI. Or, I mean, I, I didn't like the word AGI, but now I use it anyways, because that's what everybody uses. Um, and that leaves the impression that the danger, let's say, of a runaway um, AGI is only going to happen if we have AI systems that are like, surpassing humans on like everything. But I think that's the wrong definition. A, right. a, uh, an AI could be dangerous, even if it's not as good as us at a bunch of tasks that don't matter that much. Because right. what really matters are the capabilities that allow a machine to dominate humans in, in, you know, in ways that make it difficult for us to defend ourselves. So for example, uh, programming abilities. Mm -hmm. are already something uh, that could be game changers, both economically in a positive sense and in terms of uh, dangerous, uh, national security dangers and the ability of machines to uh, you know, create a lot of damage. If you combine that with the ability to convince people like you know, through uh, dialogue, so in other words, influence uh, abilities, then you get machines that can really take over the world, even if they don't destroy humans. Right. And that that's very scary. And, and to be clear, I'm not at all downplaying the, the criticality of um, addressing AI safety. I, I think safety is a big issue. And I'm, I'm not also uh, requiring superhuman, like universally superhuman AI. To me, what I think we underestimate the difficulty of is more like achieving sentience and agency. And, uh, but I don't believe that we need sentience or agency in order for AI systems to be very dangerous as you're describing here. You know, they, uh, we already have bad actors with, you know, agency that we don't, you know, you know, they can provide yeah. enough negative and troublemaking agency, you know, for the systems, if the systems can uh, provide them leverage in doing the, the misdeeds that they seek to do. Right, right, right. Well, let, let me, let me, let me, let me talk about, about sentience and agency. Okay. Because uh, I think a lot of people share your uh, point of view. Uh, I'm going to start with agency because that's the easy one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, RL agents... In, in whatever environment they're in, already have agency. Now, of course, what we care about is agency in the real world, like in ways that can affect humans. But it's mm -hmm. actually pretty easy to connect uh, an LLM to the real world through a browser. This is what uh, the sure. um, AutoGPT guys did. Now, it doesn't mm -hmm. work that great right now because it's not being trained uh, to be really good at making plans in this environment. Right. But that could change. So, so agency is already just something that human designers provide. So even like chat GPT has agency because it, it, it's talking to real people. That's, mm -hmm. that's the real world. What could it do bad? Well, it could convince people to do things that are bad uh, mm -hmm. or you know, change their mind about something. So uh, agency is already a done deal in a way. 
Now, we, we, we should control agency. So we need, I think, regulation that says, well, if your AI system is going to be having uh, access to actions that could have a negative impact, then you need to tell the government and you need to make sure you put the right guardrails. Now, let's talk about sentience. That one is hard. Before we switch to sentience, when I context or, or intent around agency was actually rather intent focused or goal directedness right agency in a goal directedness sense but we have already goal directedness yeah we have that so goal directed reinforcement learning that's like already exists and in fact if Agreed. you think about what happens when you use uh, an, uh, a chatbot y- your question is like a goal and the you know it's 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 already stating a goal when you you, you put your query. Uh, if your goal is to build a bomb and you say, you know, tell me how I can you know build a, a bomb with you know, that kind, well, that you're already doing goal condition. You're already conditioning on something the human specifies. So it's and and the technology for uh, goal conditioning in reinforcement learning is is not you. I mean, people have been making it better and better. So in the old days, the idea of reinforcement learning agent was they would be, they would not be conditioned on anything. They would learn a task, right? Mm-hmm. But but as people have been moving towards more powerful agents, it it's actually works a lot better, especially with neural nets, if you train conditional agents where you know you you can basically specify the task and then it does it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know how to do that. It's been done in in like academic or like uh, virtual environments, but there's no reason why it can't be done. Uh, for larger systems. Is that agency and goal directedness the same as saying the AI wants to do X? Because I think that's really what I Well, object that's to. an interpretation. That's, yeah. that, that's the problem is, is it, is it like just intentions. semantics? Is it, is it just yes, semantics it and I should semantics. just give up on it? Like you've given yeah. up on AGI and just accept that we're yeah. talking about the same thing. Yeah. It, in a way, it doesn't matter that much. So okay. what matters is the behavior. I mean, especially if you think about safety to society and people, like, does it matter if it looks like you have an intention and you're carrying out a plan or if it's something different going on in your brain? Some what matters is somewhere that yeah, somehow right. you're taking some instructions, maybe provided by yourself or by someone else, and you're carrying out actions to achieve those outcomes. That's fair. Uh, it. For me, it is intention, but okay, some people don't like us uh, AI scientists to use uh, words from psychology to describe what, what AI systems are doing. I've been doing it anyways, so I, you know, I've, I've talked about things um, like uh, intuition and reasoning mm-hmm. and intention is, is you know, one of these words that really has to do with what's happening in, you know, between our ears that's we only get indirect clues about. Yeah. So it's hard yeah. to make sure, but in a way it doesn't matter. I think what, <laughs> I've what gotten really into matters the same, is, is I've gotten into the same not? fights about reasoning also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get it. Um, so sentience. Okay. Okay. That one is very murky and there's consciousness of course, which is sort of related and different. So the, the accepted sense of sentience right now is, related to consciousness has to do with feeling um, pain, for example, especially. And that where is that feeling happening in animals and humans, for sure? It, mm-hmm. It's happening at the level of what we are conscious of. So mm-hmm. if something is bad in your body and you don't feel it, you don't, you don't have sentience according to that definition. Now I have a very like pragmatic interpretation of these concepts. So, if an AI system perceives something bad for it and then acts in response to that, to avoid it, um, that, I don't see much of a difference with uh, when we talk about pain and fear and you know avoiding something you don't want. The, the difference may be qualitative as in, um, I mean, um, a question of degree, I mean, so, uh, pain, for example, uh, when it's very uh, strong for us, will like, dominate everything in, in the way we um, think. And, and also humans have a very rich palette of feelings. 
uh, social contexts. You know, uh, this this. There's many, many variations on what can go wrong and makes us unhappy. But but the, the basic principle, even uh, low, uh, you know, animals that, that are like much less uh, developed intellectually than we are, um, will respond to pain and dangerous situations, behaviorally speaking, as if they were feeling something that they're trying to, they don't like, they're trying to avoid. And AIs do that already. Now, okay, so, 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 so. Um, so let me I, say a few words about consciousness. Just jumping it's, it's in there weird. before you before you get to consciousness. Yeah, yeah, please. It, it feels like your pragmatism there is in the same vein as your pragmatism around agency, goal directedness, intent, these other yes. ideas. And it feels, particularly in the case of sentience, like a very slippery slope. Uh, it is. Chat GPT says that, oh, what you said really hurt me. Right, it responded to human input in a way that it portrayed was negative to itself. Does that mean it's sentient, according to no, your perspective? No. How do you differentiate the two? Yes. Okay. This is a great question. So, Chat GPT and the LLMs in general have been trained to imitate how humans respond, and so we know by the way they're trained that they're faking it. I mean, like Chat sure. GPT might say, I, "I'm unhappy," but <laughs> It's not true. Um, to deserve the the sort of my pragmatic view on, on on pain or fear or other like feelings, you would have to have an agent that is actually acting in a way to achieve uh, something good or avoid something bad. Um, and we have that like in 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 other um, RL agents, so like game playing agents, for example. Or uh, yeah, so it, it's it. I don't think it's the case for the LLMs when they say something like this that it's really so uh, that doesn't count for sentience. It, it has to be connected to you know emotions or there's the word motion in there in in the root, which has to do with action, which has to do with acting in order to achieve or avoid some some context, some some situation, which isn't really what's going on with these LLMs. They're just Mm, parroting how humans would respond in a very powerful way, but but not because they actually feel those things. But it seems like it would be easy to construct a toy system that you know is an LLM coupled with a a an agency yes. thing, you know, an agency state machine that would satisfy your definition of being goal directed and being negatively impacted but still doesn't pass the smell test of, yeah, this thing is really sentient. And, and so I guess this, it, let, maybe- let, let, me, let, me just, <laughs> okay. let me just say something about this. So there is a problem with sentience and consciousness, which is we're bundling the mechanics, like the pragmatics I've been talking about of like reacting to signals right. in order to avoid something bad, for example. With the mechanisms. Uh, no, so we, we're bundling uh, that with- the social construct, the social uh -huh. contract. So why do we care so much about sentience and, and consciousness like subjective right. experience? It's because we, if the entity in front of me is sentient or conscious, uh, we will like try to respect its right to life and, 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 and not having pain. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the rights of animals is an issue because if they feel pain, we have empathy and we want to avoid, I mean, some of us uh, will be shocked that we would hurt animals, especially think about your pets because we have a relationship with them. They're part of our society. Um, the closer the animals are to us in some way, and we kind of treat them like other members of society, the the more that you can see that it, the, the more we... Um, we are concerned about their moral rights. But I think it's a big mistake to attribute similar moral rights to AI systems. I mean, we could, but it would be um, exploiting um, a, 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 an incorrect generalization that evolution has put into us. Evolution makes us feel, like uh, empathize for other beings that look like us. That's why we, we are much more uh, sensitive to the pain of mammals that look like us 
and much less mm -hmm. to the pain of uh, um, uh, fish or insects, right? Mm -hmm. Even though actually they probably satisfy my definition of you know feeling pain and trying to sure. avoid it. That that feels a little bit like being out of line with your otherwise pragmatic view. It's it's like if we take all the teeth out of saying something that's is sentience, you know, or is, is sentient, then it doesn't really matter if we say this thing is sentient. Well, so so I, I, I think the problem is we can't avoid it that if something looks sentient, we'll feel empathy for that thing. And so my recommendation until we understand better is to avoid building AI systems that's, that are going to look conscious or look sentient. Because okay. you know, whether you believe that they really are or not becomes immaterial. Right. What happens is we will uh, want to treat that entity like a human. Mm -hmm. And is that good? Well, maybe, maybe not. In particular, if we uh, treat an AI like, uh, like us, that means we grant it or we, we design it, we give it a, as a goal, uh, it's self-preservation. That could be dangerous from the point of view of uh, a rogue AI that, that might be in conflict with humans. So I, I, I'm not saying that we should not ever like consider giving moral rights to AI systems. I'm just saying it's a very dangerous and complicated thing, and we should not do it until we understand better, both philosophically and, and, and technically, what's going on. I recently interviewed Alex Hanna from Dare, and we spent a bit of time in this same general uh, landscape talking about risk. And you know, I think what she might say is that you know, even though we have kind of pulled back from worrying about you know sentient, self-intended AGI, and we're talking about AI being misused by humans, we still are distracting from even more tangible and present abuses of machine learning based systems uh, in, you know, finance and housing discrimination and all these, you know, types of use cases. Um, yeah. Any reaction to that perspective? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is a great question. Uh, so first of all, to put some context, I've been worried about the, negative social impact of AI, and of course, working on the benefits of AI as well, and things like healthcare, the environment, for almost a decade, and speaking about these things in my talks. Yeah. Um, I, I, I played an important role in the Montreal Declaration for the Responsible Development of AI in 2017, 2018. That's really about the ethical principles to develop AI. And this was well before LLMs. We were already thinking about what can go wrong, and we were mostly thinking about human rights. Mm -hmm. So I'm very uh, sensitive to this, but I don't think it has to be an either or. We, we have to protect humans. We have to make sure, you know, uh, people don't, people are safe and, and treated properly according to human rights. I read the, I reread the uh, UN Declaration of uh, Human Rights uh, from, you know, after the Second World War. It's, it's amazing. I, I should like really uh, advise everyone to, it's very small. Um, and we are far from that ideal still. Mm -hmm. uh, our democracies are not that democratic. And the world order, you know, with rich countries and developing countries is also not aligned with those values. Mm -hmm. And we should, you know, make sure we protect everyone on this planet uh, from all kinds of abuses. So for me, that includes the, the, the bad things that are happening now and the bad things that could happen next year and in three years and in five years. I don't, I don't think that we should, it should be an either or. Uh, I think everyone who cares about humanity, about uh, the well-being, especially of those that, that are the weaker, that don't have a voice in all this, um, should be embracing all of the risks and harms. But I understand people are concerned that the discussion is going to detract from the short-term risk. What what I've actually found is, since the you know the the that sp this this spring, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, concern about the the major risks, actually it has accelerated the movement of uh, governments towards regulation, and that's a good thing because, as far as I can see, that 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 regulation is going to help deal with all the risks. For example, it's going to introduce 
audits and um, making sure that companies follow some rules and, and protect, you know, that human rights are protected. And we know what is going on in companies. I mean, we, some representatives of independent people are going to be able to check. Right now, we can't even do that. It's a, it's a black box what's going on in these companies for, for the, the, you know, citizens and even governments. So I, I think we can work together, the people who care about the current harms or those that could happen quickly and, and those that are those people like me who care about all the harms and all the risks. Awesome. Awesome. So with all that said, how are you approaching uh, exploring these kinds of risks from a research perspective? Well, so f first of all, when you're doing research, you need a bit of humility. Uh, I've, I'm new. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, that you, you need to be aware of the limitations of things you know and don't know, especially. So I've been spending a lot of time reading about AI safety and the literature and what people have been thinking about and gradually forming my thoughts about this. But I, I, I don't come to you or anybody saying, oh, I know, you know what's what needs to be done and what shouldn't be done. But I'm starting to form let's say, views on um, uh, what we may hope uh, to accomplish to reduce the risks uh, of misuse and loss of control. And on the reason, so there is, first of all, uh, I, I, you know, it, it became very clear to me that technical solutions are not sufficient because even if I could build a safe system, somebody could misuse it or uh, you know give it incentives to uh, become dangerous for humans. And by the way, he, little parenthesis here: there are people who publicly say that they will uh, design, if they can, AGIs that um, that are self-interested and that will eventually replace humanity. And humanity should just let go and you know let the next generation of intelligence that are s smarter than us take over. I think this should be criminal. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so so I, I'm saying this because the you know, the technical solutions are clearly not sufficient. We're going to need governance and political solutions that are right. combined with the technical solutions. So now on the technical side, first of all, I've been gradually understanding better at least some of the ways in which things can go wrong. Um, so it has to do with the notion of alignment, that, that there's always going to be a mismatch between uh, what we intend and what the AI systems actually are trying to optimize to choose their actions. And we, we can reduce that, but we're never going to be able to get it to, you know, maybe uh, satisfying uh, difference, especially if the AI systems are potentially able to uh, surpass us at, at, at dangerous capabilities. Um, and, and in fact, one governance solution that people talk about is pure ban on systems that whose safety is uh, not guaranteed. Uh, and that's, I think, something that, you know, it's an option. So uh, a lot of that, um, in, in my opinion, comes from reinforcement learning, uh, where you, when you maximize, when you have an AI system that tries to take action that maximize a reward because that's where Paperclip things maximizer. can go wrong. Yes. Um, so what can you do else? Well, if instead of maximizing what they think is right, which might be wrong, they were acting more like Bayesian agents. In other words, they were taking their own uncertainty into account. And if they had a good model of human psychology or even individual preferences, if if, if the AI is in, you know, faced with a human in particular, we might be in a better shape. So one of the problems with LLMs... But now right are now, you... For example, yeah, go ahead. Does that, does that take, uh, imply that you need to legislate, you know, something as, as low level as architecture or objective function? I think yes. I think that some ways of designing and training AI systems are more dangerous. And one mm -hmm. of the things I'm trying to do is... What are, the, what are the factors that make different kinds of AI systems uh, more or less dangerous? Um, okay. So basically, an AI system can be dangerous if um, it, is, uh, it has you know, strong uh, capabilities that may, may be harmful. Um, 
it, if it has agency, so it can do stuff that's bad. And um, if there's a misalignment, like it, it doesn't uh, do the things that we think it should be doing. And so going back to um, kind of intuitive way of thinking how we could get safer AI systems is imagine an AI system that actually understands well human psychology. So then um, even though um, it, it it may not have a perfect model of what we do, it, it might get a better handle on what we what humans typically uh, have in mind, and also even the, the diversity of humans that each human is slightly different. Uh, we want a we want inclusive understanding of the diversity that exists in humanity, so that it's not just about uh, a generic white male <laughs> preferences, but but like everyone uh, uh, eventually. So so we we need AI systems that can understand better the world, but also understand their limitations. The fact that um, they don't have a perfect model of uh, how we think and 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 uh, what we want, and thus act in a conservative way. So if you're Bayesian, you you're um, trying to keep track of all the um, theories or explanations for for the behaviors of humans, um, uh, so that when the time comes to take a decision, you can take into account the fact that you're not really sure about say how what a particular person thinks or how they will feel about some action that they might feel harmed. Mm -hmm. And that uncertainty is what is currently missing, I think, in um, uh, LLMs and, and, and large uh, neural nets. Right. Uh, we need systems that are better able to uh, know their limits so that if they're not sure, they will defer to a human or they will not act in ways that could potentially be dangerous. And right now, you've got these highly confident answers coming from LLMs that could be completely wrong and completely dangerous. Uh, and I think that's a very dangerous path. Mm. So it sounds like in a lot of ways, you think that the solution to AI safety, to, to use that broadly and full knowledge of, you know, how broad it is, is, you know, can't be technical, needs to be governance driven, but that the technology needs to drive how the governance happens, how we govern them. For sure, for sure. Um, and by the way, in the process of developing safe AI systems, we could also make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And we need the governance to make sure precautions are taken by whoever is uh, you know, doing these training experiments or deploying AI systems. Um, uh, right now, one thing I want to mention is there is very little investment in, in building AI systems that will not harm. Um, it's like a 50 to 1 ratio in terms of dollars. Of course, the, the profit uh, motive is, is putting most of the effort in uh, more capabilities because, of course, that will unlock more applications in the real world and is worth trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not right. I think we should put at least as much money on protecting the public as we are on making AIs more powerful. Because we're like apprentice sorcerers, like we're playing with this and oh, it's cool, it's exciting. And a lot of people are doing it focused on the, you know, all the good things or the money they can make uh, and not thinking enough about the potential risks and the potential harms. Uh, and that's something we need to fix quickly because it takes a lot of time for legislation, regulators, treaties, you know, typical treaties, international treaties take a decade to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a high probability that we will get to AGI within a decade. I don't know. It could be multiple decades, but it's, it's very plausible that at the rate at which things are moving, we will have very, very powerful systems, powerful enough to be dangerous in, in, in you know, the next few years or decade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remind me, were you a signatory of the letter suggesting a moratorium yes. on AI research? Uh, I think one of the biggest critiques of that was that it, it was just not practical and there was too much at stake for kind of sitting it out. Like, how, how do you think about that effort and the response to it? Yeah, I, I knew when I signed it 
that it was very unlikely that companies would stop doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But I thought it could really be um, a, a strong signal sent to everyone and the public that something is going on that we need to better understand before we continue racing like crazy. And it worked. The That letter, and then the, the letter two months later, uh, not the letter, but the declaration um, mm -hmm. about uh, existential risk with AI, I think really helped the public and governments see that there were a large number of experts um, in academia and in, even in industry in the companies that are building these systems that think that we are not careful enough. Maybe circling back to kind of research and technology, where do you think the kind of biggest holes are in our knowledge? Um, you know, both our, our understanding of the technology, but also in methods and approaches for controlling it. Do you have a sense for where there are significant uh, opportunities to contribute from a technological perspective to the, the overall challenge? Yeah. So if I look at the progress we've made in AI and what's missing to reach uh, human level uh, abilities, I would say there are three main things and we got one of the three pretty well. So one thing is what I call system one, intuition. We have systems that can reactively produce answers without really taking the time to think about them. So that's system one. Like you, I ask you a question, you respond right away. Um, you don't take the time to ponder in your mind and consider alternatives. That's your intuition speaking. You, you already knew it or it's sort of obvious. System two is when you can ponder, you do ponder about something. So that's when you reason, you kind of think about it. My grandmother told me when I was young, you know, uh, turn your tongue seven times in your mouth before you speak. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the, the failure of current AI systems when you try to make them uh, produce answers on topics that they haven't been trained enough on and require internal sort of deliberation. Um, they're getting better at it because they can practice, but but uh, it's like some, some piece is missing. As I said, I don't know how much time it's gonna take us to, to figure that piece. And then the third piece that is, that is missing is robotics. So all of the systems we have now, they are really good at like language and abstract things that we can communicate with images and, and sounds and text, but Controlling a body, that's like a different question. And we're still very, uh, we're like uh, 10 years ago with uh, images and, and, and sounds and text there. Um, how much time is going to take to figure that out? I don't know either. But one of the hypotheses is that one reason we're not doing that great with the current methods is simply we don't have the scale of data of entities controlling a body that we can it's have a lot more with expensive and images. Yeah. We, you know, you would need to maybe like, you know, have a, a fleet of a million robots in order to get the sort of data that we have in other settings. So that may be one of the barriers. Maybe there are others. So these are three things that are missing, but from a safety perspective, the first two together would already be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, and with enough training data, even the first one alone is is dangerous. Um, so now the interesting thing is, if we make progress on system two, which includes systems that better understand how the world works, not just reasoning, but also being able to plan with respect to a fairly good understanding of like the causal structure of how things unfold in the world, then there's actually a way to exploit that to make them safer. Because if they better understand what we want, what is moral and what is not, for at least for different people, then they can act in a safer way. If So in a way, the danger is a, an AI that is very good at some things that could be destructive, but actually doesn't understand well enough what we care about. Implications. That's yeah. where it can we can suffer. So meaning... If you if you're taking off an AI that's being used as a tool for negative uh, intentions or towards negative ends, 
the next thing to worry about is an AI that inadvertently does bad things because it has no idea. It, it just yes. doesn't know any better. Yes, but it, it could even happen with a runaway AI in the sense mm -hmm. that even if we were to program it with uh, some like uh, three laws of robotics or whatever moral yeah. instructions like uh, clothes constitution, it might still misunderstand what we wanted and do something really bad. It, mm -hmm. it, trying to do good, but doing bad. And there's a lot of arguments that have been made. I mean, it sounds like, why would it happen? But actually, there's a lot of arguments that have been made in the AI safety literature, how things in a way that's unintended could turn out really bad. Um, so one of the things I've been worrying about is called reward hacking. So mm -hmm. the AI system could, say, cyber hack the computer in which you say what you do is good or what you do is bad and then yeah. give itself a lot of rewards like, oh yeah, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good. Because that's what we're asking it to do, to, to act in a way that it, it's going to get a lot of good rewards. And, and that could be a very dangerous situation because once it's figured that out, then it wants to continue getting all that good reward. It means it doesn't want us to interfere with that. If we figure out that you know it is tempering with the computer, we will stop it and they will want to prevent us from doing that you can see how things can go really bad even if we start from a very small misunderstanding uh is the reward what we're typing or what we're thinking mm -hmm. you know two or three things that you wish more people working in the field uh you know had access to thought about uh you know i'm asking for pointers or resources it sounds like the the UN Human Rights Declaration is one thing that um, you know would be you think would be great for folks to you know have uh, exposure to. What are some others? Yeah, so um, I worked hard on uh, a testimony I gave to the U.S. Congress to Senate uh, last July. It's uh, you can find it on my blog or you can find it on the um, U.S. Senate uh, webpage. I have a link. Uh, also to both the video and the text uh, that you can find on my blog, my webpage. Um, and it contains a number of recommendations for policy and also um, recommendations, not just about policy, but what governments should be doing, uh, in my opinion. Um, so one is, of course, to beef up the regulations. And you know, there's a lot of details here that you know, what can be done quickly, even before we better understand the risks. The other is we need to better understand the risks. So we need to invest in research on you know, how, what can go wrong and how could we potentially make AI systems and the governance of them safer. So that's research in AI safety and AI governance. Uh, but we, and we need a massive investment in this because right now it's like peanuts. And then the third thing is, well, regulation is not going to be 100% foolproof. So how does society protect itself beyond regulation in case something goes wrong, in case uh, there's a runaway AI or uh, some you know, uh, country uh, starts using it in, in ways that could be really threatening? So I call that countermeasures research. It's almost like national security research, but it also raises really challenging democratic governance questions. Who's going to have access to the frontier AI systems that could be used like militarily or in, in, in uh, cybersecurity uh, or in, in ways that could be both good defensively against bad AIs mm -hmm. or dangerous in the wrong hands? How do we make sure there's no abuse of all that power that is going to be constructed? So I think we need to beef up the infrastructure that we're going to put it, the institutional infrastructure to... Um, avoid concentration of power and, and avoid um, misuse. But at the same time, we need that power to defend ourselves. Because if, if there is a superhuman AI out there that is doing really bad things in terms of cyber attacks, and it's stronger than our best human programmers, well, we need our cyber defenses to at least have the same level of capability to, to uh, protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Yashua, thanks so much for joining us once again to uh, update us on your work and thinking, and in particular, to talk through some of these important issues around AI safety. Thank you for having me. <laughs>